Hi there. Welcome back to KG and Associates Straight Talk for Mental Health. I'm here with my associate, Janice D'Souza. Hi, Janice. How are you today? Hi, Karen. It's been a long week, but I'm good. Happy it's Friday. How are I you? Know. Here we are, like snack dab in the middle of winter. And um, <laughs> yeah, I know it's been a long week. And uh, yeah, you know, it's getting sunnier, but still, you know, we're in the throes of winter and it, and it can be hard on a lot of people and uh, a lot of things happening out there. I know that January is divorce month, so I know you and I were just talking at some point we should really uh, have a discussion about what we're doing to help our clients who are um, considering divorce or going through divorce or sometimes even dealing with the aftermath of separation and divorce mm -hmm. and their family. So yeah, we've got that listed up here. There's so many topics to cover. Uh, what I wanted to talk today about is seasonal affective disorder and depression, reactive depression, male covert depression. There's a lot of different uh, pieces to this. Mm -hmm. I know that I uh, recognize that Monday. So what was that? The 16th, they called that blue Monday. Um, and I was trying to find how that date even got arrived. Is it always the same Monday in January? I don't know, but um, um, obviously seasonal affective disorder is real and we do see uh, higher levels of depression uh, during the months of, you know, between November and February, uh, just purely due to lowered vitamin D and sun exposure, mm -hmm. light exposure, um, isolation, especially if you're not kind of like a, a ski bunny or anything. So, so let's talk about this. What do you see at your end, Janice? Like, what do you start thinking about when you see clients who are suffering with depression or, um, you know, what, what, where you start kind of going in your head on this or what you want to be doing? Yeah. So right off the bat, like with seasonal affective disorder and even personally, as well as I've had a lot of clients bring this up, like you said, it's that lack of the vitamin D not getting enough sun. And especially with the shorter days and longer nights, a lot of clients tell me like by the time they're finished work or like it gets to four or four thirty, they're just, their mood just kind of goes down. It's, it's almost like they're like, they don't want to do anything because it's so dark outside. It's so gloomy. You kind of just want to stay bundled up in your house. But at the same time, all these feelings of loneliness also exist. And you don't, you know, as much as you'd like to kind of maintain those social connections and the social interactions in life, you really can't get yourself to do it. And I think that's a huge piece that does build on that depression side of it because you're kind of restraining yourself within your house environment. Then it's dark yeah. outside and it's on repeat, really. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, it's almost a bit earth shattering, really, to think that, you know, how the seasons evolve have such a chemical impact on our brain and body. And I mean, I know because I, I have a, um, a home based office that's downstairs. And I know like in the throes of the winter, like it's so dark and then I'll go upstairs and it's like it's already dark outside. I know a lot of people uh, who are working from home or going into the office, it's sometimes it's like dark going to work yeah. and then already dark coming home from work. Yeah. And yeah, I think we, it, it literally changes the chemistry in our brain for what we, what our energy is, what our motivation is. So we can get trapped by what we call, right? We call it in our practice, stinky thoughts of depression that, but I don't, I'm too tired to do this. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. I won't have fun if I do this. So all of those stinky thoughts that get mobilized or activated from just, just purely by lack of light. Yes. And if we're not on the lookout for it, we will talk ourselves out of doing everything. So we cocoon and isolate. And then of course we know that just makes it worse. So it's uh yeah, even if we just isolated that one aspect of like darkness, right? It's just yeah. that, like, it's almost like a primal instinct to just like cocoon because it's not <laughs> light out. I know it's so hard. I know. And the first time, like I even really heard of seasonal affective disorder, I was curious to know if it's just kind of like, is it more of that emotional piece and our mindset that just kind of changes because it's dark or is it actually that physical body, like biological piece? And I found out that there's actually like a chemical reaction in our body that gets affected or like lower levels. I forget what it was, but it was lower levels. Or of dopamine. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So internal, like biologically, 
we're affected and then that kind of affects our mood as well as yeah. you know yeah and you were going to say about melatonin right because that's yes. but that's the sleepiness of like of uh you know not having the light because our brain depends on that exposure to light to tell us when to sleep and when mm -hmm. to wake up but it's like yeah so you're driving home from work it's already dark yeah less dopamine more melatonin i'm just gonna go home and you know and crash and then you know all the stuff that goes with that and then of course covid you know just just invited all of that too because everybody was um socially isolated so um but yeah seasonal effectives i remember when they first started producing the sad lights and mm -hmm. i remember even being skeptical like what is this right and it's like amazon selling a light to put on yeah. your mask and um and then i started looking more closely at the research and it was a bit because here we are in mental health and we're, we're doing therapy and we're yep. looking at childhood trauma and clinical depression. And then somebody comes along selling a light. Yeah. <laughs> it felt a bit like, what is this? And then right. everybody yeah. started talking about it. Yes. Right? Whether they got the alarm clocks. I love those sad al alarm clocks that is like slowly kind of gets brighter what a nicer way to wake up in the morning. It's, it's maybe it's snowing and raining outside, but I'm exposing myself to this, you know, kind of increasingly brighter, beautiful light. Uh, people started buying um, the sad lights for their desks at work. Um, and just the pure exposure to the light mm -hmm. gave a different signal to their brain to yes. wake up. And all of a sudden, there was more motivation and more uh, energy, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's like called light therapy now or like exposure to light therapy. Like they're even like social workers and stuff are using it in practice now. So it's, yeah. it was very interesting when they first started that for sure. Yeah, I know. That's like the, the, the more modern term. I still call them sad lights because I remember <laughs> when they came out, it was like sad light. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah I mean obviously when we're completing our assessments we um, always inquire about whether there's a component of depression and how that's affecting and and oftentimes we will get clients describing higher depression in the winter months mm -hmm. as we said um, and so so this is part of it um, I, I, I saw you post earlier this week about Eeyore and it was yes. like such a great <laughs> picture, right? And tell me about that post and kind of what that meant to you to be putting that out there. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I always loved Winnie the Pooh. It was just such a pure mm -hmm. TV show movie, like just so much innocence. In it. And then when I came across the Eeyore post, honestly, when I was a kid and I used to watch the show, I didn't know that like Eeyore was depressed and it wasn't actually just a pose because I did hear as a adult that the portrayal of Eeyore was like the way his mood was it was a portrayal of depression so when I saw this post again recently and just like how it was like he didn't have to be his full 110 percent to be loved by his friends all the time was just so it was just so pure that feeling of just understanding when someone's not feeling their best and going through a hard time, but not pushing them to like, be like how you're feeling at that moment, but just letting them be with it, but giving them that comfort of your presence. Yeah. So that's what I really like. It was just, it really touched my heart. And I was like, I have to share this. Uh, yeah, I loved it. I mean, I mean, sometimes these animation films or shows, it's like, you can enjoy it as a child. And then as an adult, you understand yeah. the layers to those stories. It's, it's incredible. Um, but yeah, there's this balance of understanding, uh, where somebody's at and also giving them that compassion or connectivity, because oftentimes one of the biggest elements of depression is that it, it, it kind of like flies you under the radar where even people who care about you don't really even know what's going on. Um, and so the loneliness and the isolation sets in and also feeling that lack of, connectivity or understanding from others because oftentimes people will mask the depression mm -hmm. it's part of that um kind of self-talk that can kind of get mixed up so I think that there's so many different components of depression that we need to look at mm -hmm. um, as clinicians whether it's seasonal affective whether it's covert depression whether it's mass depression reactive depression uh, from grief. Um, I feel like we really need to be 
experts, right, in mm -hmm. understanding that it that depression can take on many different forms. And it's up to us to figure out kind of what that person's specific experience with depression is, because even though there can be common symptoms, mm -hmm. the reason, the experience, the manifestations, the consequences yeah. are so unique. Um, but I love that post because it does mean that Maybe it, it maybe it invites all of us to think about um, our own uh, experiences of depression, or if we know somebody in our life might be, um, we haven't heard from them in a while, or they're mm -hmm. seeming to have reasons why they can't, you know, socialize. Um, <clears throat> it kind of like brings it up higher on the radar. <clears throat> yeah. And I think so that's the key piece, like recognizing that depression doesn't look the same for everyone. Like not all the common symptoms will just be there. Not everyone will feel the same way and it won't be as recognizable, but really understanding those differences. And just like you said, if you haven't heard from someone for a long time, kind of just, you know, give them a quick message or a call just to kind of check in. Yeah, I see those posts regularly from people and friends of mine that um, kind of put put it out there that, you know, it, it's one of those hidden elements mm -hmm because of the depression you're hiding, but because it's hidden, it can be hard to notice. Yes. And, and we feel even more isolated or less understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. So classic clinical depression, right, is that chronic state of lowered energy, lowered motivation, the isolation, oftentimes that accompanies, is accompanied with those generalized self-criticisms where we've had a pattern of being way too hard on ourselves, mm -hmm. um, and we are overthinking um, the negative traits or negative patterns or negative behaviors we're showing up with. And also from a cognitive perspective, it's about projecting that all onto other people or some people in our life where we get into the negative mind reading, mm -hmm. where we will overanalyze the negative impact we're having on other people. Um, and, and then it just takes us out. So I recently posted that spiral. I don't know if you saw that about, you know, how uh, losing hope can then spiral down to depression. So oftentimes we'll see it building, right? Where it's like one thing happens, we're hard on ourselves, we lose hope, you know, mm -hmm that leads to more bad decisions, <clears throat> excuse me. And then all of that kind of takes us on that road of depression. So I kind of feel like that's kind of our classic depression um, that can be in a chronic state. Does that make sense to you as I kind of go through all of those symptoms? Yeah, no, 100% it does. And those are like, those are the ones in our practice that it's recognizable as well, because a lot of clients come in saying, you know, they just haven't been motivated. They're not able to concentrate or focus on really anything. Forget like if it's not even work or school, but things that they once were interested in doing or even meeting mm. friends is no longer something they can physically even bring themselves to or even emotionally bring themselves to because they're exhausted. Yeah. And I think that roller coaster is hard <laughs> because if we have this idea of who we used to be or how we used to achieve things or how we used to show up in our life, and then we think about where we are now. It's a bit, it's a bit like um, shattering in the sense of how did this happen? And sometimes mm -hmm. then almost we get a secondary layer of depression because now we're depressed about the depression. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, because we have this idea of who we used to be and who we aren't anymore. You know, pretty, yeah. pretty heavy stuff. So this is how we look at this in a more comprehensive way understanding that person's unique like experience of it and then of course what to do with it reactive depression right to me this is where sometimes what we will say in the work that we do is how we go through loss and I often say it this way um, so where there's a loss there's grief and when we don't kind of resolve the grief then we get into complicated grief Mm -hmm. which then can put us at higher risk for depression. So there's this whole channel of what happens when we go through a major loss. And, you know, it, it's kind of, it's not like three clear stages. They sometimes will go back and forth as grief does, but 
we do see higher rates of reactive or clinical depression amongst those who have gone through a major loss and then for whatever reason couldn't figure their way out of it or through it. Um, I mean, loss never really completely goes away, but we do know that people who are able to somehow work through that grief, they're able to kind of hold it in a place that doesn't take them over on a daily basis, right? What do you think about those pieces? Yeah, with grief, um, I like that you brought it up um, in relation to this topic. And with our work, something that <clears throat> I like that we mentioned is those waves of grief. Mm -hmm. um, because like you said, sometimes it's like, you're not sad anymore. And then the next day, it's like all of that sadness just comes back. And I could see how that would contribute to feeling depressed even more. Because one day you're like, wait, but I thought I was okay yesterday. And now I'm just feeling so miserable again, what just happened. And it just in your mind, like you're spiraling pretty much because it's like, I felt one way yesterday. Now I feel really like, a complete opposite way this day so you know being hard on yourself once again fe feeling confused so all of that like contributing back to once again like the classical depression yeah definitely yeah I, I love that you brought that up about the waves of grief because I know it's so important that we educate um, on normalizing those waves because to some degree like one degree or another when you go through a major loss those waves are to be expected but if I don't have any idea of how I'm going to deal with that wave when it peaks, mm. um, then the likelihood that another wave is right behind it is likely, right? And then before you know it, we can be drowning. And yes. so we, yeah, we could probably do the whole podcast on grief, but mm -hmm. suffice it to say that if I'm not figuring out how to deal with those waves, you know, then I'll be, be drowning and, um, and then it can it can start to get generalized where mm -hmm. it's not just sad for me about the loss, but it's if I'm drowning, then not only can I not manage that wave, but I literally can't swim at work or swim at school or swim in my relationship. So I love that what one of the things that we do that is so important, and this is kind of a bit from our dialectical emotional regulation mm -hmm. program, is the importance of labeling, right? not not to kind of like constrain us but to clarify right so i always like um, and i'm sure you do this with clients as well it's we we start to distinguish between sadness mm -hmm. grief and depression yes and and how those three can look and feel so different but working through the reactive depression associated with grief so yeah i guess we do a little bit of like the depression management but because we're always looking at deeper layers, we understand what that particular type of depression, mm -hmm. resolving the grief or working through grief um, is, uh, is so important. Like I said, we, we should do a podcast on, on our specific grief tool. I, I, love, thinking, yeah. I, I love doing that tool, whether it's a loss of a relationship mm -hmm. in particular, that one I really love because um, a part uh, from death or accidents or illness, uh, relationship grief, we, we see it coming up all the time, mm -hmm. don't we? Yeah, I think our listeners would love that because it's such an important topic. And like you said, loss, like loss can exist in so many ways and happens yeah. most of the time when you're not even expecting it. So exactly. And especially if January is divorce month, I guess it's yes. because, you know, that new year uh, mm -hmm. feeling of taking stock in our life. Yeah. Um, I usually saw two big uh, times of the year where separation and divorce, um, some people see it more in January. I, I always see it higher in the summer, especially with families where there's children mm -hmm. and people trying to mobilize resources between the school years. And I, I often saw it in higher levels then. Let's also talk about male covert depression. And um, I, I was, uh, I had the TV on last night and I think, oh my gosh, what's her name from Saturday Night Live? She's taken over the Daily Show from, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to, she's an SNL, black woman from SNL. I, I'm going to have to look this up. Uh, she has taken over uh, Trevor Noah's Daily Show. And I have to look this up because I want to see. She did a great job. Yeah, the new host, Leslie Jones. Okay. Oh. 
I don't know if you can picture her. Uh, and I didn't even, I think I knew that Trevor was, was retiring, but, and I don't know if they're having a different weekly host each week or not, but last night, and, and she did, I should have recorded it, but she did about a 20 minute dialogue on men in therapy. I mean, obviously she put like a comedic flair to it, Mm -hmm. but which was really, really outstanding. I'm going to have to find it online and, and see where I can post this, but she just like, just nailed so many issues that men struggle with and how important it is for them to get help and how they often resist help. She threw a stat out and I meant to write it down, but I forgot, but, um, Terrence Real coined this term male covert depression some mm -hmm. years ago. <clears throat> he wrote that groundbreaking book that was called I Don't Want to Talk About It. Um, so I think what was important was to identify the, the general, not for everybody, but general differences between how men and women will show depression. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't and I don't want to generalize too much, but I think what what the benefit of this research was is that more males are depressed than we realize and how they show it may be typically different than our um, original ideas of what depression looks like based on kind of what you and I were just talking yes. about. And um, actually, the therapist that I went out in open my private practice within 98, this was her area of specialization. It was mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, so I think we have to, I think for our male listeners out there, they may begin to look at, well, it's not that I'm staying in bed all day. It's not that I, I'm not out with my friends, right. but looking at some of the more generally male adapted take on depression, which could be, alcohol or drugs mm -hmm. over socializing yes. you know sexualizing uh, like sexual acting out yes. uh, temper and anger and aggression and again these are generalizations but uh, but some people would look at that and go oh well it's about alcohol it's about sex mm -hmm. it's about anger when really when you dive a little deeper there's all of this like sea yes. of depression what do you think about that whole area yeah, with the male covert depression, I remember a few months ago, I had shared a post on that as well. And just oh. that idea of having to keep up that masculinity, where vulnerability growing up wasn't a thing like, you know, that thing, like boys shouldn't cry. Um, stuff like and being grown up like with society and the gender stereotypes and having to listen to that all the time. That's pr primarily one of the main reasons, as well, that probably male don't express as much nor is it as evident even if they are depressed and like you said it comes across in other areas whether that's with alcohol the engaging in sexual activity so it does come in other ways but I think a huge part of that is just the way you know society still is in some sort of way having these gender stereotypes and roles and setting you know males up to feel like oh they can't express what they're feeling right I mean this this kind of to me adds a whole other dimension to our understanding of this area um yes even though things are evolving and 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 we we see the genders balancing out in many different areas of life there still is that socialization thread out there mm -hmm. about what males how, what males are expected how they're expected to act or feel yes and it adds on, yeah, in some ways, a whole other negative pressure that like for males, oftentimes, not everybody, but oftentimes feel like they don't really have the permission mm -hmm. to express vulnerability or what would be seen as weakness. Yes. I think it's hard enough for most of us, right, to manage that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. But there's that added piece of what what males think males are expected to be looking like or doing. And so it adds that whole other layer of shame, I think, for mm -hmm, them if mm -hmm. they're not feeling yes. like whatever masculinity is supposed to look like, you know, or if they're really struggling, it's like they don't have that permission to reach out for help. And this is what Leslie Jones was saying in her narrative about how hard it is for men to come to therapy. Yes. And um, 
and how much they need it. And, and she pinpointed all of these pieces that could be part of, of the covert mm -hmm. depression. It, it, sometimes it isn't, but oftentimes it is. And, and I see this in, in the clients that I work with a lot um, where there's loneliness or shame. And um, sometimes for the first time in their life, men are making those connections mm -hmm. and it's pretty powerful when it, when it comes because then they can, they can begin to give themselves the permission mm -hmm of feeling what they do and understanding themselves and feeling that freedom. Um, I remember when The Sopranos was on um, HBO and almost every episode started with Tony in therapy. And I, I would say things like Tony, like Tony Sopranos making therapy sexy for men because <laughs> most of us love Tony, even though he has yeah. some crazy, you know, stuff. Um, and, um, and I do remember at one point I had over 50% of my clients were men and it was after that show was so popular. I always, I, I meant to, I meant to post something about that, the Tony Soprano effect. <laughs> um, I don't know what the equivalent would be. I mean, Jonah Hill just put out that documentary yes, yes. with his therapist and, you know, and I, I think Jonah Hill's a pretty likable uh, actor, but um, yeah, so I think when we're seeing men, we, we need to do better. I think we need to do better in the mental health field to, to make it easier for men to step forward um, and, and to, to create a safe space for them that's private and um, helpful. Uh, to maybe um, help them break out of that and, and whatever the associated symptoms are. So, so a broad topic today, but many different pieces to it. Mm -hmm. um, if, if any of our listeners are out there are, are struggling with depression, what would be like one or two things you think we should say to them apart from all of this material we discussed? Like, how do we, how do we help our listeners be hopeful? What do you think we should be you know, broadcasting today about that. I'm putting you on the spot, but <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah. I think that's our like, message. <laughs> yeah. So definitely I, the first thing that comes to my mind is be patient with yourself, um, whether that's depression in any type of form and especially more so now that we're in the winter months and we're not done yet. I know this is going to go to like April really. Um, so be patient with yourself, reach out to your social connections as hard as it can be, like, especially with the, seasonal affective disorder and sad as hard as it is to get yourselves out of the house even if you can't get out maybe do a video call a phone call anything to kind of keep yourself more engaged and move away from that loneliness um so try and connect as best as you can and just be patient with yourself it's okay there will be off days days where you don't want to do anything but don't don't kind of let it affect your mood and engage in that cycle yeah. Oh, yeah. You, I, I love you, Janice. You just come up with these great ideas. I think together as a team, I, I really feel like I, I can be looking at this and then you're like, yeah, Karen, but what about that? I just, I just love that we can do that because, yeah, patience. Yeah. Being kind and gentle to ourselves um, to try and reduce some of the pressure that may help us even look uh, at more solutions um, definitely right. Reaching out. Um, one of the stinky thoughts of depression is that it will take too much energy. Um, and generally speaking, if we can mechanically push ourselves to reach out, we will be glad that we did. And we will, we will feel, I mean, it's maybe not the whole solution, but we will feel a little bit better for having had that connection video call yeah I mean this is something that happened with the pandemic more than ever before right all the zooms um that even if I don't feel ready to leave home um facetiming or zooming with friends where we have that facial interaction um and of course it's opened up our therapy world because now it's made easier for clients who don't feel ready to come in person, have another option. And to me, that has just blown up the mental health world mm -hmm. and how many more people we can reach. So that's been yeah. great. 
Okay, so for our listeners, um, so I'll, I'll definitely will be posting this video, we'll be posting the, the Spotify podcast to listen on your own uh, time and to reach out. So our website, uh, KG and Associates, KarenRSW.com, uh, we'll be able to find all, more information about the services we provide, especially in this area of depression, uh, with the booking links available on that site. Uh, also reaching me directly at 647-985-0633. And uh, Janice, your direct number here, 416-316-7686. Um, I'm at KarenRSW at yahoo.ca. And Janice, did you want to just give the listeners your email address there? Yeah, for sure. It's j6dsouza at gmail.com. Perfect. So many different ways of contacting us. Um, and as with any of our other clients, with clients reporting depression, we will start with that structured assessment uh, to be able to get a very comprehensive view of what's triggering or stressful for them, uh, what the impacts are, are of those, uh, and also doing a comprehensive history. Because what we really stand for is that accountable therapy where we can provide formulations to our clients with depression to give them all of the connections they need in order to begin making uh, making some changes that they will uh, feel better about. So great, Janice. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for coming in and uh, look, you know, have a great week. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.